Um, first of all, I think that we should take a quick pause in light of the weather and congratulate all of us here for actually being in this auditorium at 9.30 the day after a record snowstorm. It's so great to see all of you. Thank you so much for being here. I know some of you traveled far, some of you just around the block, but you braved a lot of snow to get here. And we have a great program lined up for you today. My name is Steve Edwards. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Politics, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation featuring U.S. Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan in conversation with our director, David Axelrod. As so many of you know, it's part of our ongoing speaker series where we bring leading figures in politics and policy to campus to talk about the key issues of the day. You can find out more about our series on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. I should also point out that today, we will have uh, the first of two seminars today at 4.30, tomorrow at 4.30, with Tim Phillips of Americans for Prosperity, one of the leading conservative thinkers and organizers in America today. That will take place just two blocks away, just really a block and a half at the IOP house at 57th and Woodlawn, so we invite you to join us there as well. We also want to welcome in all of the viewers who are joining us on our live stream today. For those of you who are interested in subscribing to podcasts of our event, you can do so by going to iTunes slash you. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to welcome to the podium Connor McDonough. Connor is a second year here at the University of Chicago. He's majoring in economics and in Arabic. He's also head of the European Commission for the Model United Nations group here on campus. Um, he's also active in the IOP, of course, and doing a very American thing, introducing one of the leaders of an American institution today. Connor McDonough, welcome to the stage. He'll introduce our program. Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everybody. With the Supreme Court set to hear arguments on the Affordable Care Act subsidies, marriage equality, and capital punishment, these nine justices could determine some of the most important issues of our generation. And with the divided bench, many of these upcoming high-profile cases are uncertain, leaving room for these justices to become some of the most influential in our age. Joining us today, today to discuss her life and work, I'm honored to introduce Justice Elena Kagan. Born and raised in New York City, Justice Kagan earned her bachelor's degree from Princeton, going on to earn a master's in philosophy from Oxford, where she studied the jurisprudence of the Warren Court. After graduating from Harvard Law School, Justice Kagan taught here at the University of Chicago before leaving to serve as Associate White House Counsel and Policy Advisor to President Clinton. In 2003, Justice Kagan became the first female dean of Harvard Law School and later became the Solicitor General of the United States before being tapped by President Obama to serve on the Supreme Court. On August 7, 2010, Justice Kagan was sworn in as an Associate Justice on the U.S. Supreme Court where she is known as a powerful voice on the bench, made known for help, helping to dissect complex legal concepts and make them easily accessible to everyday readers. Here to moderate today's discussion is David Axelrod, the director of the Institute of Politics and former White House senior advisor. Please join me in welcoming Justice Elena Kagan and David Axelrod. First of all, we should applaud you for yeah, being here really. on the Monday after the Super Bowl <laughs> and a blizzard. So uh, I think it's a tribute to, to you, Justice Kagan, that uh, these young people have roused themselves to be here on this I uh, Monday it. morning. And uh, I will say, you're, this, is not this is not unfamiliar turf to you. You spent four years here at the University of Chicago. I know you- Cross the midway. And you uh, still signed up to come here on, on, in February. In February. What was I, I thinking? Exactly, right. And we provided a classic Chicago day for you to uh, snow filled and freezing. <laughs> um, so let me, uh, let me start by, uh, the, as we were talking. Can I say just, um, yes. just, just how happy I am to be here? I mean, I did spend some number of years of my life in Chicago and at this university. 
and, uh, and, and loved the time I did that. And it's also great, David, to be here with you. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, we went through my confirmation together. Uh, we hadn't known, and that's, it's sort of an ordeal, I have to say. And uh, it's, it's nice. You, you not, weathered it well. It's, it's, it's great to have uh, wise and good people around well, to help you, you through that. And thank you were you. one of well, those. It was, a, it was a great opportunity to be a part of that. I'm proud of that. Um, let me just say as a, dis, uh, as a disclaimer at the beginning that uh, uh, we're going to have a discussion about uh, Justice Kagan's life, uh, some of the, some of the uh, workings of the court, and uh, some of the people that she's uh, worked with over the years. Uh, what, we're, what we can have a discussion about are pending issues before the court uh, for obvious reasons. So if you have questions uh, prepared to ask how Justice Kagan intends to rule on a particular question, um, spare us that because she ain't, she ain't going to answer. Okay. So, um, but but let, let me start uh, just a little bit on your life and career. You grew up in New York City, as right. was mentioned. Uh, it's been widely noted that in your high school yearbook that you were posing in a judicial robes yes. with a gavel. Embarrassing. So this seems like a <laughs> seems a little bit like early foreshadowing here. Or, Maybe overconfidence. I, I don't know. Which. <laughs> but uh, what? What? It was why? an accident. It, was it? Yes. You know. So uh, we being were doing, on the court or wearing the robe? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we were doing some kind of yearbook picture for. I, I was a student government type in high school, and we were doing some kind of yearbook picture, and we just had the idea of going to raid the costume closet in my high school, and so we each picked out costumes and. I don't know, maybe there was something subconscious about my picking out that particular co uh, costume as opposed to all the others. But, um, so if uh, you've been in a doctor's... There, there you go. You, I you would have had been a surgeon stethoscope. general. <laughs> so, but uh, but what was your, did you have interest in the law then? Was that something that you could see as a career? I know your dad was a lawyer. He was. I mean, I had interest in public service. I had... Uh, I had uh, my, my, my father was very involved in various community activities, and uh, that always struck me as very interesting and very meaningful. Um, uh, I, I didn't really think that I wanted to be a lawyer. Nothing that my father did actually struck me as so exciting on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, uh, you know, I learned differently after a while, but I, I went to, to, to law school not particularly thinking I was going to end up loving law or being a lawyer. But it, in fact, I did. I, I walked into law school and I thought, uh, gosh, I'm glad I'm here because uh, this seems like absolutely the perfect place and the perfect things for me to be thinking about. And, um, and you, went, you went to law school, uh, but you really, you practiced law briefly, but you, you clerked for a couple of... Uh, I clerked for a couple of years for a great man who uh, is a great Chicagoan, yes. Abner Mikva. Yes, and who then, began his political career here in Hyde Park, was in the state legislature right. from Hyde Park, went on to be a congressman from here and the northern suburbs he moved. Yeah. And then... Uh, and always had this very uncertain seat where he never knew every he, two years came around whether exactly. he was going to win it or lose it. Exactly, exactly. And then took uh, a judgeship to get out of that bind. Exactly. Um, We'll t talk about him, and then I want to talk about the other ju uh, justice that you worked for. Yeah, well, I mean, he, 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 he uh, Ab Mikva is, as everybody in Chicago knows, just an awesome person. I mean, he's somebody who mentored me and who took a real personal interest in me in a way I'm never for going to forget in my life. And he's somebody who just lived and breathed public service. He's, uh, uh, I think, you know, one, one of the only, one of the very few people who have served as a, as a judge and then in... Uh, in, the, in the legislative branch as a congressman, and then also had a significant experience in the executive branch as counsel to President Clinton. And in all those capacities, I think, just really gave of himself and, and, uh, and thought about all those jobs, not in terms of anything that they were going to get for him, you know, but he was really just a, a selfless person, always uh, trying to figure out, you know, what he could do that was going to make a difference to the communities that he cared about and to our country. And, uh, and uh, I, I learned a ton from him. I learned a ton about how government works and I learned a ton about um, how to be a mensch, you know, how to, how to, how to be just a, a great 
uh, person, uh, and you know, if I if if I learned half of what he is, I'd be very grateful. Yeah, he inspired a whole generation of people in this area to get involved in the law, get involved in politics, get involved in public service. The president just re recently gave him a very very significant award, yeah, the Medal of Freedom, the Medal right? of Freedom, yes. right? And yeah. uh, and and uh, when when Ab came to D.C. for that, a whole bunch of his former clerks and all the people who worked for him in Congress, we all kind of got together. And if you looked around the room, you thought, you know, however significant his accomplishments were in each of the places that he worked, uh, it's also a really significant accomplishment that he mentored all these people. And, uh, and that's something I think about when I deal with my own clerks, and I hope I'll continue to think about. But, you know, one of the, it's like the, you, you think of it as a small thing, but it can end up being a very big thing is that the people that you uh, have a, a really close personal relationship with, you know, to the extent that you can help in any way uh, to allow them to do all the great things that they have the potential to do, that can have such a ripple effect in the world. Yeah. Well, that's sort of the underlying philosophy behind this Institute of Politics, where we know that in this audience there are future justices and governors and senators and congressmen, perhaps presidents. I think a couple of you said to me, you think you'll be president. But, uh, <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. Um, what about Justice Marshall? Uh, well, that was an extraordinary experience. So I clerked for Thurgood Marshall. And uh, it was, um, he was coming to the end of his career. And, and he was a little bit uh, in a place, I think, where he was looking back on his life. And we were the very lucky young people who got to be in the room with him when he was doing that. And, and so we would uh, walk into his office every day or every other day, and we would sort of do our business first. And uh, he was an incredible lawyer. I mean, I think he was the greatest lawyer of the 20th century. Mm. And when you talked law with him, you always saw uh, how and why that was so, that he had an instinct for just getting to the nub of the matter. He's very sharp, very penetrating in the kinds of questions that he would ask about a case. We would do that. We would talk about the cases that were going to be argued and, and the cases that we were writing opinions on and uh, for some amount of time. And then he would sort of somehow find a way, uh, he would segue into telling stories. And he was the greatest storyteller I have ever met in my life. Just, an, just a, a raconteur. And, and in a year, I don't think he ever told the same story twice. Huh. And he told lots of stories. Um, and he had lots of stories to tell. I mean, this was a man who had lived the most extraordinary life, you know, growing up in uh, a segregated community in, in Baltimore and then being part of the uh, really leading the generation of civil rights attorneys that brought down Jim Crow, that uh, created Brown v. Board of Education and all the cases that were associated with that. Um, and then had done so many sort of different and in, 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 in interesting things, uh, both you know, at the same time and later. He, was, he, had, he had done a, a tremendous amount of criminal trial work. He had sort of traveled the deep south in those uh, completely segregated days where uh, you, know, you, had to, uh, you, you, you couldn't eat in the same restaurants, you couldn't use the same bathrooms. Um, going from small town to small town, like representing uh, black defendants who had been charged with the most serious crimes very often uh, were innocent, but it was very hard to get a fair trial and a fair jury um, down there. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, not just hassle, but uh, physical danger attached with what he was doing, which was to sort of go into a very small community um, and sort of like upset things and, and, and try to make Say the process the least, come yeah. out differently. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's an amazing book that I, I read about him a couple of years ago. It's called The Devil's Grove, which just took one of these cases uh, that he did down in Florida. And it's an incredible story, and uh, both about him, but also about just the way the police departments worked in, those, in, those, in that era. And, uh, and reading that book, it just sort of brought back to me what it was like to sit in his office for a year, hearing these stories. It was just getting 
It's like somebody opening a door to an, uh, this incredibly important part of American life and American history. And, uh, and then he being, you know, one of the figures that changed all of it. Yeah, absolutely. So now you're sitting where he sat. Uh, when you consider cases, uh, how, how much does that experience inform the way you think about these cases that come before you? Well, I think kind of everything that you've been a part of, in some sense, informs who you are and, and, and what you bring to the job. Um, I, I mean, I think it would be a mistake for me to try to be somebody else. So I don't, I don't go into the job thinking, oh, this is this justice whom I admired enormously and who meant a lot to me personally, and I'm going to uh, replicate what he did or what he believed or what he thought. I mean, I have to be my own person and my own, and my own justice. Um, but certainly, I think, uh, I think what I got out of that year was a sense of how much law can matter, can matter in the, with respect to the society we live in and the lives of people in that society. And, uh, and often when you do law, um, you know, I mean, a good lawyer really has to focus on all the technical aspects of law and not just the technical aspects. I mean, you can't, you can't be kind of just creating your own ideal universe. The, you know, the law is a bunch, a set of rules and statutes and constitutional provisions that have been given to you with traditions and histories. And it's, it's, it's not about like, oh, I think this, or I think that, or I think the world would be a great place if. But at the same time, I think it's an important thing to recognize that uh, the, the, the decisions that we're making are not, abs are not abstract, you know? They're decisions with actual consequences in people's lives, and that that's also uh, uh, part of being a, a wise and good judge is, is remembering that. Now, your, your experience coming to the court was different than that of your colleagues. You hadn't been a judge. You, pr you practiced law briefly at Williams and Connolly, but mainly you uh, taught law when you, uh, when you were involved with the law. And then you served for four years in the Clinton administration, and you were involved in, uh, in and around policy for four years. What did those four years uh, do in terms of informing uh, how you uh, approach these these cases? Well, you know, sometimes uh, I think that the job that I had that I think about most on the court is just the job as teacher. Uh, and so both at the University of Chicago and later at Harvard. And that seems a little That's bit That's in of, the East, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, right, it's the... The, what, what is the, I, want to ask, I want to ask you about that, uh, uh, something about the Ivy League and the Supreme Court in a second, but go ahead. Okay. Um, but you, but the, way, the reason I think about it is because uh, when I taught, so I would come in in the morning before a class and I would think, okay, so how am I going to communicate this incredibly complicated set of legal materials to this crowd of people who I'm going to be facing? And these are all like smart people and engaged people, and hopefully they had done their reading and all of that. But, they did, but they, there, was, there was also a sense in which they didn't know a whole lot about what I was going to be talking to them about. So you have to find ways of talking to them and of communicating with them that are going to make them, try to make them understand this complicated body of legal material. And not just understand it in the moment, but you have to do it in a way that it will stick with them. That, uh, so you, and, and when I write an opinion, or even when I think about you know, what I'm going to say at conference with my colleagues, uh, that's often the, exactly what I try to do. I try to put myself back in that mindset and say, and for sure this is true of writing opinions. It's like all these people are going to be re reading this opinion. They're all going to pick it up, and they're, they're smart, and they're interested, but they don't know a whole lot about this uh, material. How am I going to explain it, and how am I going to... Uh, really uh, pers persuade them that this is the right decision in this case. And, and so I think a lot about, about that kind of uh, preparation for teaching when I do that. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the question I wanted to ask you was, um, everyone on the court was educated in Ivy League law school. 
this is not a University of Chicago question, by the way. I don't, well, I think there should be a few representatives of the University of Chicago Law School on the court. That's a different issue. But, but the University of Chicago itself is an elite institution. Yes. Uh, I know when we were considering, and when the president was considering nominees for the court, one of his concerns was that uh, is to, to bring a diversity of experience as well as uh, other, other kinds of diversity. Um, it, does it trouble you at all that one apparently needs to be educated at Harvard, Yale, I guess Columbia, Justice Ginsburg, in order to serve on the court? Yeah, so b before I answer the question, I'll tell you a funny story, um, which, which I, I think it's funny. Uh, uh, You've already got them. <laughs> uh, so as you know, when, when you're nominated, you go through this sort of rigmarole. It's not the, what, 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 what all of you see is the public hearing, but that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. It's before the nominee goes to the hearing, uh, the nominee goes and meets with countless numbers of senators. I think I met with us uh, someplace in the 70s, or maybe it was even low 80s. And, um, and you do it in this kind of order. So the first person that I went to see was Harry Reid because he was then the majority leader. And I sat down and he said to me, so he said, well, it's very good to meet you. Uh, he said, I told the president I wanted two things of a nominee. And he said, you have one of them. Said, oh, okay, what, what are the two things I said? So he said, the first thing I told the president was no more judges. No more people who had been a judge. And as you said, I, have, I had not been a judge, and I'm the only one on the Not current. for lack of trying, right? <laughs> exactly no, you, no, right. You were, you, were, you were appointed by President I was, Clinton. I was and, nominated. And, and, <laughs> yeah. And, and nominated, and, and the nomination never it just, was It just never went on. anywhere. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Uh, uh, so I thought, okay, good. I wasn't a judge. That, you know, a lot of people think of that as a, as a bad thing, but that's good <laughs> that, there's, that there's somebody who doesn't. And I said, what was the other thing? He, and, I, and he said, I told the president... No more people from Harvard or Yale. I thought, oh. uh, so I'm glad he didn't take that too seriously. Yeah. But um, I do. Th I think it's an issue. I don't think it's an issue for some of the re reasons people think. Um, I mean, mostly the way I think about all these various biographical things, uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, gender, race, da 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 da, -da um, things is, is that it it, it doesn't. Um, affect decision making in very many cases. There are occasional ones where it might, but that for the most part, having a diverse court on any of those um, uh, metrics is, is, is not all that important for actual decision making. What it is important for, I think, is, is, um, is I just think it's a good thing to have our governmental institutions um, be ones that people feel, uh, you know, you know, look like America is one way to put it, but people feel as though the governmental institutions are connected with them in some real way. And, and, and sometimes, you know, I'll, uh, I'll look out and to the audience when we do our, when we sit at the court and there are lots of school groups and I think, isn't it great that all these kids are sitting there and they're seeing uh, a court with a lot of uh, different uh, racial and ethnic diversity and religious diversity, and uh, they're seeing a court with three women on it. And, and that's important not because it really affects the decisions we'll make, but just because it's something like that people can say, this is an institution that I can relate to, that I feel confident is working for me in some real way. And I think with the Harvard-Yale thing, with respect to a different class of people is a little bit like that. I mean, I go all over the country and I talk you know, to, to not just a elite universities like this one, but to lots of state schools and lots of schools that, um, that are private, but that just are at a, a, you know, not serving the same kinds of communities, not elite in the same sort of way. And I get this question all over the place. It's like, okay. what is this about the Supreme Court that it's been taken over by two law schools? And again, I don't think that, that's, uh, that it matters all that much in terms of how we make our decisions, but it certainly matters in the way people think about us and the way people feel, you know, do these folks have our back, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to take into account. Yeah. Um, so so you, 
you were Solicitor General before you became, uh, uh, before you were nominated. So you had some exposure to the court representing the United States before uh, the court. Uh, but, uh, and, and what were your relationships like in that role with the justices and how were you accepted when, when you arrived? Uh, really warmly. So um, the relationships with the justices, I certainly got to see a lot of them and they certainly got to see a lot of me because um, as Solicitor General, the, the court hears arguments every month, two weeks of arguments, and the Solicitor General typically does uh, one argument for each sitting. So by the time the end of the year rolled around, I had done six or seven arguments. So they got to see me, I got to see them. Uh, I had known some of them, a few of them from other uh, contexts. But that relationship, the SG justice relationship, is one where there's a good deal of familiarity, but it's all sort of across the podium. You know, it's, uh, it's not a really, it's not a personal relationship, it's, it's, it's just, I know who you are, you know who I am, but we're just talking as lawyer and judge. Um, and, uh, but when I got to the court, it was just, I, I mean, one of the great things about the court, and I think it's, it's something that a lot of people don't see and don't get, they read sometimes our opinions, and our opinions can be quite aggressive, even when we speak to each other. In other words, the exchange between the majority opinion and the dissenting opinion might seem almost kind of hostile, but it's actually an incredibly warm institution. So, you know, a couple of, 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 of stories about the Chief Justice, for example, <clears throat> was that the, the, uh, when I got confirmed, it was about uh, it's the middle of the afternoon, and this is important only because, like, literally the moment after the uh, last vote was cast, uh, I was in the SG's office at the time with all my colleagues there, and uh, the phone rang, and it was the Chief Justice. But he was in Australia at the time, so it was three in the morning, his time. But he had sort of stayed up just in order to be the first person hmm. to make that call. And then um, when I walked into the Supreme Court the first day, which was a few days later, uh, he greeted me, and uh, the first place he took me was to the robing room. And the robing room is this place where, you know, it's like sort of high school, it's like lockers. And, and you, each person has a name on their locker and, when I, and it goes by seniority order, which we sort of do everything by. And so when I walked into the robing room, he said, oh, well, you know, here it is. And, um, and my predecessor, John Paul Stevens, his name was still up on his locker. And the chief said, oh, well, that will be your locker down there. Justice Sotomayor's name was still on that one. And, uh, and then he took me all around the court and he introduced me to folks and he showed me things around the court. And then we wound up in the exact same place that where we started in the robing room. It was about 40 minutes later. And in that 40 minutes, they had changed all the names. So there I was with, you know, I want to know who, infl that. who inflates the footballs. So that's what I want to know. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Obviously, we live in, in, in times of great polarity in our politics. It, it was reflected in the fact that uh, I think you got 61 votes when you got confirmed. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, who had been the general counsel for the ACLU, got 96 votes back in the 90s. And Justice Breyer the next year got, I think, 87 votes. Uh, but this has become, uh, the courts have become, like everything else, tied up in that, that polarity. That doesn't extend to the court itself. When you get in conferences, do you, is there a sense of caucuses? Do you, uh, is there an ideological kind of divide within that room that is clear each time? Or I think people are curious as to how, you know, aside from sort of your per personal relation, but how do you relate as justices when these issues come before the court? Yeah. I think there's remarkably little sense of like there are teams or there are caucuses, um, essentially none. Um, you know, I think we try not to do anything that would suggest that. Um, you know, we don't meet in those kinds of ways. It's not like, uh, you know, um, those guys are meeting in this room. And I mean, the, 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 the only time we meet as groups are really when we meet as an entire group, um, which doesn't mean that there aren't some one-on-one -on -one conversations happening around the building, but 
uh, I think everybody tries really hard not to let it have that feel of, of uh, you know, uh, there are groups or teams or caucuses or what have you. And I think people try really hard also uh, to listen to each other and to learn from each other. And, you know, everybody focuses on the cases in which we are divided. And I don't mean to say that those aren't important because we are divided on some important issues. But um, remarkably, two-thirds of the time last year, we agreed 9-0. Now, you know, that's unbelievable because... All of these cases that we're doing are hard cases. They wouldn't get to us unless there was some kind of division or split in the lower courts. So they're all hard cases. And yet somehow we managed um, uh, a good deal more than half the time. Usually it's about 60%. Last year it had gone, it went up to two thirds to actually talk you, to each other. Says, do you independently arrive at these opinions and then find, my goodness, I, 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 didn't, I never realized I'd agree with you. Well, I think part of it is that we share a lot more in common in terms of our ways of looking at law and, and the way we respond to legal issues than people realize. So that's one part of it. And the other part of it is I think we do a lot of talking and listening to each other. And so that sometimes we'll go into conference, <coughs> excuse me, and we'll, and we'll go around the table and we won't be 9-0 at the beginning. Um, uh, will be much more fractured than that. But people listen to each other and people try to find consensus where they can find consensus. And often the conversation will sort of go on uh, after the initial go round of, of going around the table, go on and say, you said this, and you know, I understand why you say this, but how about that? And sort of questioning each other and talking to each other and coming to some kind of consensus. And again, I think the chief, is ex the chief justice is extremely good about encouraging that in his sort of role as kind of head guy. And so we do that. Now, all of Are those exchanges less acerbic than some, some of the crosstalk on the bench in public? It's totally not acerbic. It's, um, uh, I think that we all respect each other a lot. I think we all like each other a lot. My colleague, Stephen Breyer, the line I've often heard him use, um, and he's been on the court a lot, lot longer than I have. He's been on uh, for more than 20 years, and he says, you know, I've never heard a word spoken in anger there. And I think that that's true. I mean, people are grown-ups, and they know that they're going to disagree on some things, but they know that they uh, also can learn from people who they disagree with and try to figure out, like, what's going on and why there are uh, these disagreements and whether they can be bridged. And sometimes they can't be, you know, in some important cases. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I remember my first conference, it struck me as very peculiar, and now I understand it a lot better. We were talking about two cases, and one of them, I don't even remember what it was, but it was an important case. It was the kind of case that you thought this is going to wind up on the front page of the New York Times. And the other case was a, a, it was a very uh, lawyerly kind of procedural issue, and I'm not even sure it was all that an important lawyerly kind of procedural issue, although some can be. And the important case, we, we uh, went around the table, and the, the way we do it is we go around the table once, and there's a rule that nobody can speak twice before everybody has spoken once, which is a very good thing if you are the ninth person to speak. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we went around, and we all said our piece, and it was a 5-4 decision, and, uh, and that was that. You know, and it took 10 minutes, and there was no real engagement back and forth. And the second case comes along, as I said, much less important. We go around, we say our piece, we were uh, divided in various kinds of ways, but then a real conversation broke out and we talked about this not particularly glamorous issue for another 40 minutes until we had arrived at a place where we thought we had kind of gotten it right. And I thought, well, that's really interesting like, and sort of mysterious to me. Like, why is that? And, but I think it's because there are some kinds of cases where you're not walking in with strong priors and where you realize that there can, uh, and a lot of our cases are like this, I mean a lot of them, where you really can persuade people. And then there are others, not so much. We're gonna take some questions. So if you have questions, you can queue up there at that microphone uh, in the center. And uh, while you do that, let me just, you mentioned that you're aware that a case may wind up on the front page of the New York Times. You're all bright, literate people, Harvard and Yale graduates mostly. 
Uh, and uh, you follow the news, obviously. Um, how much does sort of the contemporary debate uh, and sort of the social implications and political implications of, the, of these debates uh, seep into uh, the thought processes of the justices? And how do you avoid it? Yeah. Uh, being human being. Well, I mean, I think we're all, we live in this world, right? And, um, and, uh, and we don't stop reading just because we become a judge. Uh, so I think, uh, at least for me, I won't speak for anybody else, but the, that I'm aware of the kind of general discussion that goes on about the court and about legal issues. I don't think we're much affected uh, uh, or really at all. It's like, you know, people say, well, you know, do you, do, you, do you read the newspapers? It's like, I read the newspapers, but, you know, the newspapers are not going to tell me how to, how, to, how to think or how to vote. That's not where this is uh, coming from. So I don't think it has much effect on us uh, in that sort of way. I mean, I think in a more broad-based way, the society you live in obviously uh, uh, affects the kinds of cases that are coming to the court and the kinds of decisions that the court makes. Um, you know, the sort of obvious example of this is, you know, that the court that decided Brown v. Board would not have decided Brown v. Board 20 years earlier. And that, you know, there's something about living in a society which, is, which affects the way uh, judges understand the law, statutes, the Constitution. And, uh, and so, you know, it's not, isolated from the world. But at the same time, nobody, I mean, nobody really cares, honestly, whether uh, the editorial page of the Washington Post is going to give a thumbs up or thumbs down to your latest decision. It's just not relevant to so what we do with the way of we lifetime think. Appointments, huh? There you go. Um, well, uh, let, let's, uh, uh, let's start taking some questions here, and then we'll, I've, I've got something at the end I want to ask you about. Yes. Ms. Kagan, thank you for being with, here, uh, with us here this morning. Um, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were about the Constitution being a so-called living document, and along that line, uh, whether you thought that there or think that there is a difference between expanding constitutional protections for... Between uh, what? I'm sorry. Oh, between expanding constitutional protections for things that did not exist uh, when the Bill of Rights and subsequent amendments were passed, such as expanding First Amendment rights or for uh, television, radio, the internet, et cetera, uh, between that and uh, applying or expanding constitutional protections for things that did exist when the Bill of Rights and subsequent amendments were passed, uh, but that people at the time didn't think those amendments applied to, uh, such as the death penalty or abortion, uh, marriage issues, uh, assisted suicide, et cetera. Well, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's no mystery that um, I'm, not one of the people who people uh, label as originalists on the court. Although I think in some sense that's misleading because in some sense all nine of us are originalists in, in, in the sense that um, uh, even e e that everybody thinks that one of the important inputs in interpreting the Constitution is um, is, is, is what the drafters of the particular part of the Constitution, and for a lot of it, it's 1789, but like for the 14th Amendment, it's 1868, is, is, is what the drafters at that time thought, what they thought that they were doing, their goals, and both at higher and lower levels of generality, right? What they thought about a particular practice, but also what they thought about uh, what vision that they had, what vision they had about what this part of the Constitution was supposed to be doing. And for me, that's an important part of doing constitutional interpretation, and it's an important part in every kind of case. I mean, you sort of divided the world into two kinds, but there are lots of ways to divide the universe of constitutional cases. And, uh, and, and I think that um, the, the, what the framers envisioned, again, both specifically and more generally, is an important, an important thing to be considered. I think that it's not the only thing to be considered. I think... Um, uh, one of the other one you, you, it, it, that are in, that the history of a part of the Constitution is also a part, so not just what happened in 1789, but how a particular constitutional provision has operated and worked in our society 
down through the years. I think precedent is, for me, an extremely important part of constitutional decision making. If you look at some of the provisions of our Constitution, they, uh, they now function in a way that the, dreamers that the framers would not have predicted. I mean, one very good example of this is the First Amendment, where the law that we have relating to free speech is very different from anything you would have found uh, in the late 18th century. But partly that's because uh, uh, step by step by step, incrementally, usually, uh, the court has created a body of doctrine relating to free expression that has its groundings in this one particular provision, but that has become larger and richer and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, where, where unlike just these few words which don't tell you exactly how to decide a case, all this precedent, in fact, may. So I think, you know, constitutional interpretation uh, is a, you, you look to a number of sources. You look to the framing, you look to the history, and you look to precedent. And, and that you do it in that more holistic way. And, and I think, you know, honestly, um, uh, the reason that makes sense to me is because if, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you just look at what the framers thought, you get a set of results that I think that our society would not be willing to live with. You know, Brown v. Board would not have been um, uh, decided by the court in the way that Brown v. Board was decided if all that the court had asked was, well, back in 1868 did the framers of the 14th Amendment uh, envision segregated schools? And the answer was, yes, of course they envisioned segregated schools, and of course that they thought and the 14th Amendment actually had nothing to do with that. But they had a broader vision, too, and it was a vision that sort of worked itself out over time in such a way that when Brown v. Board was presented to the board, it was the absolutely correct thing and almost unimaginable for it to have been decided otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Very exciting to be here talking to you, uh, Justice Kagan. You touched very briefly on uh, the idea of looking at the at the possible implications and results in the real world of decisions that are made on a legal basis by the court. And I would like very much for you to go into that in a little more detail. To what extent do or should the justices look at their decisions and say, think about how they are going to play out in the real world and affect people's lives? Well, I think you, 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 uh, you do that only within this frame of real, true legal decision making. I mean, because we are presented with cases, and it's not like, how do you think the world should be? It's instead, uh, here are two parties, and they have a particular kind of legal dispute, and that dispute will involve particular sources of law. Maybe it will be a statute. Let's, let's say uh, that it's a, it's a question about how a statute ought to be interpreted. And it would be utterly the wrong thing to do uh, to say, how do I think this statute should have been written? You know, I think it would be a good statute if it did this. Uh, or uh, I don't agree with this statute, so I'm going to interpret it some other way. I mean, that would be, in my view, inconsistent with my oath of office and inconsistent with the very idea of being a judge. That, you know, Congress gets to make up the laws and that our job is to interpret those laws as best and as fairly as we can, irrespective of whether we think that, uh, that some statute that Congress passed is a good one or a bad one. And I think that that's an incredibly important thing for a judge to think about and do. And it's true with respect to a statute, and it's true with respect to uh, the Constitution. But, um, but often, when you pick up briefs, um, uh, lawyers do have more policy-oriented arguments in those briefs. And that's so for a reason. It's because sometimes, you know, uh, let's say a statute, it's just really unclear. It's really ambiguous. And what these lawyers will be essentially saying to you is something along the lines of, look, uh, Congress did not speak very clearly, and this is a hard decision for you. And in making that hard decision, you should think, like, could Congress really have thought this? 
because the result of doing this would be, you know, the following parade of horribles. Or arguments like that, where you're sort of trying to think, okay, in this world of uh, uncertainty about the meaning of a particular legal provision, um, uh, thinking about, like, well, if you interpret it this way, these are the consequences that would flow from it. If you interpret it this way, another set of consequences would. And again, it's not like which consequences you find more congenial, but it's trying to sort of put yourselves into the shoes of, say, Congress, and say, it was thinking about consequences. That's what Congress does, and that's an important, an important part of, uh, of hard statutory questions. That, Thanks. That strays tantalizingly close to one case you're dealing with right now that everybody's interested in, but I'm going to observe my own disclaimer. Okay, because I wasn't yeah. thinking about uh, this. <laughs> this is li literally what every statutory case yeah. is. Yeah. Justice Kagan, in a recent book by Erwin Chemerinsky, he claims that the Supreme Court's role is ultimately a very simple and contains two parts to it, that um, the Supreme Court should protect minorities who cannot um, receive equitable access to the political process. So he talks about prisoners, out-of-state business owners, religious minorities, and the like, and protecting the Constitution from pressures in emergency political situations. You look at the Alien and Sedition Acts, Japanese internment during World War II, and so on. Do you agree with this claim? And if not, what do you think the role of the Supreme Court is in the US political system? You know, I've not read the book. And, uh, and that seems uh, just like listening to you for a second. It just seems uh, a, a, a little bit cabining what we do uh, uh, too greatly. So I mean, if you look at the set of things that we deal with, it so runs the gamut. And, and, and every year, uh, everybody focuses on five or six or seven sort of hot button issues and hot button cases, but um, but a heck of a lot of what we do, um, you know, maybe a lot of you would find it boring. I find it really interesting. Just I mean, there's a lot of law in this world relating to absolutely everything and affecting all of our lives in so many ways that you don't think about. And so, you know, one day it will be a labor law case, and the next day it will be a tax law case, and the next day it will be a, law, a case about how administrative agencies work and the kinds of regulation that they do, and the next day it will be a case about, the, uh, about, about some environmental statute, and the next day it will be a case about um, a, a criminal defendant who's been, who's been sentenced under a particular kind of law. And it's just, um, I mean, law sort of surrounds us in everything we do in so many ways. And, and, you know, the reason I think I kind of have the greatest job in the world is because we deal with all of those. And we deal with them when other folks uh, haven't been able to. In other words, when the lower courts have divided with respect to particular issues. And some of them can seem very... You know, they are the kinds of cases that have a lot of public attention associated with it. Others can seem very arcane, but maybe uh, matter just as much. So I guess when I think about the court, I just focus on the ex unbelievably wide range of things we do. And, and, and uh, what always sort of amazes me is sort of is, um, you know, that every public policy issue has a legal dimension to it. Uh, and, and, and we hear them all. Thank you. Thank you so much for visiting the university, Justice Kagan. So given your experience as both a clerk and a justice, and given the thousands of appeals you receive every single year, how do you decide which cases to take? And have you ever had a moment where you wished you would have granted a cert petition had you known more about it? Um, you know, so we get about 10,000 petitions every year. And we only, argue, we only hear arguments in about 80 cases. So it's quite the selection process that we do. And what I just said to the, the, the man who asked the last question is basically the criterion of selection is what we call circuit splits. And it's just when there are courts below, and uh, often there are uh, uh, federal courts of appeals, but it may be state supreme courts arguing with each other too. Um, that are all trying to decide the same question and are coming out in different ways. And we're the kind of people who get to say, okay, well, they got it right, they got it wrong. And sometimes that's for very important legal issues. Sometimes they're not so important in and of themselves, 
they're only important because it's, it's, it's crucial that there be uniformity in the law, that it not matter as respects federal law for uh, somebody to be, you know, that it shouldn't happen that say under a federal sentencing law, somebody is sentenced differently in California than he is in New York. So, uh, so, so a lot of the time what we do is just try to uh, ensure that there's uniformity throughout the entire United States as to federal law. Sometimes we take cases that just have to be taken irrespective of whether there's any kind of division or disagreement uh, among lower courts. Cases that just sort of say, this is an important legal issue, and in the end, the Supreme Court should decide this. Um, uh, so if you sort of look in, is in the, the, there's a book about Supreme Court practice, and the first thing it will say is circuit splits, and the next thing it will say is sort of importance of legal question. And those are the two things that we use. You know, are there, are there petitions that go by that we should have taken that we don't? I suspect that there are. I mean, the nature of the process is that you don't really figure out what those, those are because you just deny them, and then they never come back to you. But, um, but one of the, thi one of the things I, I think it was Justice Kennedy said to me my first year of the court, he said, nobody gets very agitated about uh, which cases we take and which cases we don't, and that's actually true, that people vote, and if the votes are there, we take it. If the votes aren't there, they're not, but nobody thinks of it as... Uh, you know, something to get uh, really excited about. And the reason is because if you're wrong and if, if the issue is important, it will come back around and, uh, and we'll have a chance to decide it. So, um, so you know, the, the process by which we take cases is actually, it's very collegial, it's very cooperative. Um, the actual dy dynamics of it is all these petitions are... Um, distributed to all the clerks, and in all but one chambers, so eight of us are in what is called a cert pool, and all the clerks just operate in the cert pool so that they write memos to all eight justices in the pool. So one day I'll pick up a memo and it will be from one of my clerks, the next day I pick up a memo and it will be from one of Justice Scalia's clerks, and so on and so forth, and we all do it very cooperatively. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, Madam Justice. My question relates to the relevancy of the political question doctrine in a post-9-11 world with the authorization of military force and NSA surveillance programs and the CIA programs. I'm not even going to answer that question. Okay. So you probably shouldn't like keep going because okay. you'll make a speech and I'll say, boy, that comes pretty close to things that I know I'm going to have to decide. Okay. So then you do force, <laughs> so then you foresee potential cases relating to that in the near future. Maybe I don't not know. Court. I mean, it's, it sounds like kind of the sort of stuff we do, you know? This yeah. may, okay. <laughs> Thank you. This may be time to go to the, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? <laughs> Hello, Justice Kagan, and thank you for coming to speak with us. Earlier you mentioned that there was an inherent value in student, or in, in students coming to the court to see um, a court that resembles America. And you said that there's an inherent value to that. And so, um, <laughs> I've been thinking about this question this whole time. Um, why, does it not seem a tad bit hypocritical that the court doesn't allow video cameras into the court so that the rest of the U.S. can see what goes on in the court, especially um, students from schools that don't have the economic resources to go to Washington and see it. And then separately, um, one of the things that I study here is human rights, and uh, I was curious how much the court or you specifically pay attention to international um, human rights law or how um, perhaps in the future the court could be integrated into the international court system. Um, so uh, those are two, two good, good yeah, two, questions. Two, two good questions, very sneaky. <laughs> Which have nothing to do this. with each other, right. truly. Yeah. No, no. This man, is a this man has a future as a newspaper reporter. Um, the, uh, the, the cameras in a courtroom stuff, a hard issue. So, and, uh, and I could give you pretty strong arguments on both sides about it. I mean, you said the argument on, on one side. I mean, we're an important institution of government. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, people should be able to understand the way their institutions of government work 
people should be able to sort of see for themselves what they're doing and whether they're doing what they're supposed to be doing well. And I always used to think when I was Solicitor General that it would have a different kind of, 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 uh, of or related, but uh, uh, d different still, uh, value for the court. Because I used to sit there as Solicitor General and I used to go up there pretty much every day the court sat, not only for my own arguments, but because there were so many people from my office who were arguing in different cases before the court. So I would sit there day after day after day in the front row, kind of getting this front row seat to this institution. I used to think, this is really quite amazing how well this institution operates. And that if people were able to see it, you know, these nine people, and you know, with, with different views about a range of legal matters, but all kind of coming in, taking their seats on the bench, so well prepared, who, um, who ask such excellent questions, and who, in my mind, really look as though they're trying to get it right. Um, and that it would be great if, if, uh, if everybody could see that. And so there are lots of good reasons why, uh, uh, both for, you know, just because people should serve as a check on our government institutions, but also because people should see their government institutions working well, uh, which I think that the court does. You know, that said, there is another side to it too. And, and the other side is like because the institution works well, you, you um, are appropriately wary of doing anything that disturbs or that may upset the dynamic of the institution. And it's really easy to say, oh, well, you're all grown-ups and, uh, and you should just behave the same way once there are cameras uh, there. And you know, it's, it's just uh, if you sort of look at different experiences, when cameras uh, come into a place, the nature of conversation often changes. So, uh, I mean, honestly, uh, I, I don't think Congress is a great advertisement for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just, I, I don't mean that in a way they work generally, but, you know, it used to be that people, that uh, Congress would do hearings without cameras. And I got to say, I think that those hearings probably sounded a lot different than they do now. They certainly were shorter. They would, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, I think more substantive and more uh, really trying to talk with each other rather than uh, communicate these kind of sound bite messages to the outer world. And there unlike, is an argument, though, isn't there, that they're, that they're running for re-election. Yes. Justices are not. Are, are not. So I like to think, for that reason, that we would be less prone to that. Um, uh, but then you also have to think that the lawyers would be less prone to that. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, That's less... You, you know, less. So, there, so, so I think that there's some reason to be a little bit careful about going down this road. You made a rather lengthy argument on the other side of it, though. I, 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 I did. <laughs> um, so I'm very conflicted about this mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Do you think it's likely to change? I think that, um, I think this will not happen right now. Uh, I think that there are ways in which we can become more open to the public, and I think we'll continue to explore those ways. And I don't think... Uh, that this is one of those kinds of, you know, over my dead body issues, um, you know, that I think people will continue to think about it and will continue to explore it, but this is not a kind of, oh, and tomorrow I'll go back to the court and, you know, we'll have another discussion about this right. and change our minds. Right. International uh, law. Um, you know, in a way we do international law all the time because we have cases that come before us that involve international materials. Right, um, when a treaty case comes before you, you do international law. And that's accepted and everybody understands and agrees with that. You know, the place where it's more controversial is where, is where there's a particular legal issue that, uh, that, that seems a, that is a domestic one. And the question is, there's nothing, there's nothing inherently international in the subject matter of it, but the question is, should you look to uh, what other courts and other parts of the world do when they confront a similar question. And that's where the question has bite and where there's a controversy over it. And, you know, I have to say, I think a little bit that the, uh, I, I kind of ascribe to neither side in this controversy. On the one hand, I think um, uh, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with noticing that, uh, you know, in, uh, in Great Britain they do it this way. You know, in the same way that you would 
uh, and there's nothing wrong with citing that, right? In the same way that you would cite a law review article for like somebody has a good idea here. And, um, and why close yourself off to good ideas wherever they come from, whether it's from a bunch of law professors or it's from another court. You know, on the other hand, I have a good deal of sympathy with the view that uh, in the end, uh, we, we are not like all one big legal system and we are not all one big court, that we have a particular legal system with a particular set of legal um, sources, all our own, our constitution is our constitution, and uh, uh, our, our set of precedents is a distinctively American one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unlike some countries more recently that sort of are, are, you know, start in a place, I was recently uh, in Israel, and, you know, Israel is a place, you know, it starts in like 1950, and then they're looking all over for different mm -hmm. legal materials and different legal sources. And, and that's not the case with us. We have this very well-developed body of legal materials and legal sources. And I basically think that the question we ought to be asking ourselves is the question of what does the American Constitution say uh, or uh, about some particular legal issue. And that we, uh, and, and, and uh, so I have a lot of sympathy with people who think I don't like get why you're like looking all around the world when the question is one about what the U.S. Constitution is about. Thank you. Justice Kagan, thank you very much for coming. It's really an honor to ask you a question. Um, I'm curious whether or not you think that some sort of larger economic equality is actually necessary to a healthy democracy. For example, uh, entry-level workers making uh, about, I mean, CEOs making about 30 times what entry-level workers would be like an example of maybe a functional equality versus CEOs making three, 400 times what their entry-level workers make. In addition, uh, you know, a Citizens United decision. Um, do you think that a sort of larger equality is necessary to a functioning democracy? And is that a um, variable in your calculations? Thank you. So uh, I'm going to say something that may sound harsh, and I don't mean it to sound harsh, but it's really what I think about things like this. It's like not my job. I think that one of the important things is that we all sort of have a sense of the limits of what we do. Uh, and I think that's particularly important for judges that judges can't wander around going, uh, you know, here's, here's the way I think a properly constructed universe would look, and I'm going to do my job with that in mind. Um, uh, that to be a lawyer, to, to be a judge at least, uh, is, uh, is to understand that, there's, that there are certain things that, can, that are really important things in this world, but, um, uh, but that are properly decided and figured out by other people, by other institutions of government, and by uh, all the citizens that they represent. And uh, so, you know, I count like something like income inequality as one of those, that unless you can reduce it to a particular legal question for me, my view of this is that's an incredibly important question for the president, and it's an incredibly important question for Congress, and it's an incredibly important question for citizens of the United States, but what I think about uh, whether uh, about you know uh, uh, you know how f how far income inequality goes before it starts uh, infecting an entire society is is uh, uh, you know just my personal and private thoughts that I would try never to let interfere with the way I judge and. Again, you know, that sounds a little bit harsh, but it's, a, it's just, you have to know what hat you're wearing. And the hat I'm wearing is a judge's hat. And so I'm not like a grand policymaker and I'm not a grand philosopher. I'm, I'm a judge that's trying to decide particular legal cases uh, 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 and issues with particular legal materials. And that's my job. And you know what, it's a big job. And the fact that it doesn't involve some other really important questions 
It's just like that's what there's, you know, that's why we have a political system, a governmental system with lots of folks trying to do different things. Can I ask a follow-up? How hard is that, though? You were a policymaker. You obviously have views. How hard is it to say, I'm going to stick to my... Yeah, stick to my knitting. Yeah. You know, for me, it's not so hard. And, uh, you know, it might be for other people, but it's not so hard for me. That, uh, and, and I guess this, I don't find this surprising. In, in, in my whole life, there have been a lot of different roles that I've played. And a lot of you, you sort of like take one, I think this is often true of lawyers' careers, is you take off one hat and you put on another hat. Like and a lawyer becoming a judge. Like that. Uh, but, you know, being an SG was like this. So when I became Solicitor General, it's like what you were trying to do was to argue the long-term interest of the United States. There were, you know, often cases where I, which I argued uh, or where I, um, uh, decided on the position that the administration was going to take as Solicitor General, where I thought, you know, you know, I, if I were a judge, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't agree with the, dis but, but it's really important in our advocacy system that when the United States is represented, the interests of the federal government are being represented. And so you, that's what your job is, and that's mm -hmm. what you do. And, you know, I think it's some, it's one reason why some people are a little bit suspicious of these lawyer folks because they, they seem to be able to do that. I think that there's a kind of professional ethics involved in it that is, that is really important to me. That, um, that it's not that I don't come to everything as like, what do I think is the right thing? Um, it's, it's what do I think is the right thing for me in this position with this set of professional obligations that I hold. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's what I try to do. And you know, well, so I, I'm pretty comfortable with it. I can see. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, uh, I just want to finish on two, uh, two quick matters. How is it that you ended up going duck hunting with Justice Scalia? <laughs> and I want to ask you about a little, uh, a little uh, incident that happened or an episode during your confirmation hearing. Okay. But, but, uh, but start with uh, the Justice Scalia story. And talk a little bit about your relationship with him. Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the Justice Scalia story, it actually goes back to my nomination and the process that I went through. So some, sometimes you, know, you go to all these senator's offices, about 80 of them, as I said, before you do the, uh, the hearing. And as I went from office to office to office, so many senators, I can't tell you how many, and on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats alike, would ask me about guns, about the Second Amendment. You know, it's like when you, when you say, like, what do you think they mostly ask you about? People say, like, abortion or something. It's not. It's like it's all, it's by far number one topic in these conversations, partly because a lot of folks really care about these issues and partly because I have to say that the NRA plays some significant role now in confirmation politics. And so they all ask you, because they're getting lots of letters from their constituents, they all ask you about gun stuff. And, and they can't really ask you about, um, you know, how would you decide this case or that? So they have to find other ways of trying to figure out who you are with respect to some issue. And uh, so I, I can't tell you how many offices I walk into where people would say, well, have you ever hunted? And I would say, well, no. You know, it's like this Jewish girl who grew up in New York City. <laughs> it's like, really? Is that what you think we did on the weekend? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and uh, they, they would say, well, do you know anybody? Does anybody in your family hunt? Do you know anybody who hunts? Do you know what hunting is? You know? Um, and my answers, I have to say, even to my ears, they sounded pretty darn pathetic, you know? Well, no, no, I don't really know anybody. No, no, no. So I was once, I uh, was in um, one of the senators from Idaho, actually. I was feeling a little bit punchy. It was my 60th one of these interviews. And he starts going on about this and uh, talking about, you know, how much he hunts and, and, you know, he has a ranch and he goes out and what he hunts and, and how important it is. And it is important. Um, to many of his constituents. I mean, it is a very real thing that I think people from New York City don't really understand and know about. And, uh, uh, 
And, and I said to him, I, I, I was just sort of without thinking about it, I said, you know, Senator, I said, I've never, I've never had this opportunity and I've never had this experience, but if you would like to invite me to your ranch, I would love to go hunting with you. And the person who was with me from the White House like, <laughs> was like ready to keel over. And, <laughs> and, and the senator, I have to say, this look of total horror. <laughs> so I, said, I realized I've probably had gone a little bit too far. And I said, uh, Senator, I said, I, I didn't mean to really invite myself hunting with you. But I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a promise that if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, uh, I will ask Justice Scalia, whom I knew to be a great hunter, to take me hunting. And so when I got onto the court, I went to Justice Scalia and I told him this whole story. And I said, so this is the only promise I made in 82 office visits, you know? <laughs> so you have to, and he thought it was hilarious. He's, he's a very funny guy and he has a sense of humor about a lot of stuff. And, and, he's, and he loves hunting and he's sort of a little bit of a proselytizer about it. So he says, let's go, right? So he took me out to his gun club first, and we shot clay pigeons until I got comfortable with that. And then he's been exceptionally generous. Uh, he has the, a group of, of hunting buddies. He goes like quail hunting and, and, and pheasant hunting with out in Virginia, and he invites me all the time. And, uh, and do you uh, go? And I, I, you know, I go, um, you know, on, those are like day trips. I usually go like uh, two or three times in a year. And then once, and he, we did that the first year. And then at the end of the year, he said, it's time for big game. <laughs> so we went out to Wyoming together. We went out with a, an antelope license and a deer license. And I shot a deer. Did not shoot an antelope. I didn't get one. Uh, and, then, uh, and then this year, he said to me, but you'll really love duck hunting. <laughs> so, uh, so we went down to Mississippi together just before Christmas. And we went duck hunting. And, uh, and he was right. Really this sounds did. like a movie. <laughs> I, I can see it. Uh, so last thing, uh, your hearings were, went very, very well, but there was this one sort of bizarre moment here that I wanted to share and ask you what was running through your mind when this exchange took place. I think we have this clip queued up. Oh no, I have to now, watch myself. Um, as we so move forward Graham. and deal with law of war issues, Christmas Day bomber. Where are you at on Christmas Day? Senator Graham, that is an a undecided legal issue, which, yeah. I, it, the, well, I, I suppose I should ask exactly what you mean by that. I'm assuming that the question you mean is uh, whether a person who was apprehended in the United States is... No, I just ask you where you're at on Christmas. <laughs> You know, like all Jews, I was probably at a Chinese restaurant. Uh, great answer. Wait, we missed the part. We missed answer. the part. No, I can almost, I can almost see that one coming. I thought, yeah. I just. Me too. So you were celebrating. Senator, Senator, Senator Schumer explained this to me earlier. Yeah, he did. If so I might, with, no other restaurants are open. Right. <laughs> you were with your family on, on Christmas Day at a Chinese restaurant. Okay. Yes, sir. That's great. That's what Hanukkah and Christmas is all about. As a fellow Jew from New York, I completely understood that answer, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I understood that experience. Senator, Senator Graham once said to me, uh, afterwards, he said to me, uh, uh, you know, when I the, the audience was, uh, there was a lot of laughter in the audience among all the Jews in the press corps. Honestly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Senator Graham said to me afterwards, he said, well, that was like the moment when I knew this was, this was going. This was, uh, this was going forward. And he but, voted for you. What? And he voted for he you. He did. He was, he's, he was I, one I, of the 61. I, I'm exceptionally grateful to uh, Senator Graham. It's, it's hard, as you say in this environment to be a senator from a certain uh, kind of place and, and from uh, uh, to sort of cross over lines like that. Well, in fact, those votes Great. became an issue in his re-election. He says he's going to run for president, probably come up again. So, but at least he elicited the Chinese restaurant answer. So, good for him. If, 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 I, I, I sort of feel like, you know, 
I have a, I hope, a, 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 a long life ahead of me. And have, whatever I say, whatever I write, the thing that I'm going to best be known for is <laughs> Chinese eating Chinese restaurant. food on Christmas. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, listen, I just want to thank you. You've, uh, you know, the Supreme Court is sort of a mysterious uh, institution for so many people. And for you to come here and share your experiences and thoughts with us helps bring it a little bit closer no, it's a real to pleasure. us. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.